St. Catharines. So here's the story in labor markets in Ontario. You can see that during the recession, unemployment jumped very quickly from 6 to over 8 percent. And it's kind of stabilized there. And we think we'll actually tail off and start to improve going forward. Um, we lost some jobs on a month-by-month -month basis. or I think these are quarterly numbers. But you can see we've actually started creating jobs as a provincial economy over the last year, almost, uh, almost 18 months now. Here's the breakdown, though, for manufacturing. And I think it reinforces the story you've already heard. Manufacturing is challenged in Ontario. And those negative forces I talked about, strong currency, rising interest rates, weak U.S. market, means that manufacturers are going to be challenged. So the innovation word becomes really important. Everybody's got to put their thinking cap on and figure out how they're going to boost productivity going forward. And of course, there's a role for governments at all levels to support that sort of transformation. Because without that, um, Ontario could be drifting into a period of sort of chronic a sort of deindustrialization when it comes to the manufacturing sector. I think we've done a pretty good job as a province to actually speed the transformation, get into value-added services. Um, you know, if you compare what Toronto looks like, you know, I hate to say that word, but um, compare Toronto to what the American cities in the Rust Belt look like. Compare it to Toronto to Detroit or Cleveland, for example. We've come out of the sort of the deindustrialization of North America in much better shape. Uh, we were lucky, frankly, to have the Canadian dollar as a separate currency, which we could rely on. But I think we did a better job of planning and thinking about policy transformation. So even though it's a kind of a tough transition period for Ontario, um, we are in, I, I would argue, better shape than a lot of the rest of North America that's going through the same kind of transformation. When it comes to employment, you know, we lost jobs, 160,000 jobs during the recession, but positive numbers on a going forward basis. And next year will be better than this year. And that tells me that the unemployment rate is going to steadily fall in Ontario back towards something like between f five and three quarters and six percent two years from now. So that's all good news because those people then have money that they can spend to buy goods and services from the provincial economy. Um, so consumer spending bouncing back, you can see it was virtually flat last year. But three percent growth in the current context is not a bad number. But you see the tailing off effect. And that's very much influenced by the fact that our governments are going to have to find a way to take the stimulus back out that they injected the last two years. So governments are, can be a very powerful force when it comes to consumer behavior and overall incomes. And we're kind of anticipating there's going to be a tax challenge going out there. So we're not in the heady days of sort of 4% consumption growth as a foundation for the Ontario economy. Same sort of story with investment. This is a bit of a busy chart, but the purple bar is private non res construction that's expanding plant. You can see that contracted last year. It's growing very slowly. Going forward, we're actually expecting Ontario industry to start investing again to try and get competitive. Same sort of thing with uh, private machinery and equipment and then public sector filling in the holes. So I won't spend a lot of time there. Um, housing starts hitting the right direction. Ontario is the, is the starting point for almost half the immigrants who come to Canada. Um, part of your challenge, frankly, is to find, your fair, find a way to capture your fair share. Try and get more immigrants to settle east of uh, Scarborough and uh, really become part of your community, part of your dynamic economy going forward. So that's a positive contributor. The big challenge is government program spending. And these are the kind of numbers that were in the budget. Um, you know, fundamental questions about whether they're attainable. The, if, you, if you read the budget carefully, you know, there isn't a detailed plan. I understand that. I think we're probably a year too early for that. But after the election, we'll all be looking for a detailed plan on what Ontario's spend plan is going forward. Look at the outer years, though. Do you really think governments are going to be able to contain spending to that level? They're going to have to. Uh, the budget talked about health care, which is the great black hole for provincial spending, growing only at 3% in the final three years to get back to a balanced budget. So I won't say much more than that, except to say that really is a measure for the challenges, the fiscal challenges Ontario is going to face on a going forward basis. Uh, we may be asked to pay a little bit more. Uh, look at what Quebec just did as an example of what governments may have to do to get back to balance. Um, so wrap that all, that all that together, and I think, again, this is a pretty good litmus test for what's going to happen in eastern Ontario. Our forecast is for pretty good growth this year and over the next two years, but then that growth tailing off which is a consequence of strong currency, the fiscal challenges, aging workforce. Now, there's a way to improve that. And it's that dirty word that economists always talk about. It's called productivity, which is not working harder. It's working smarter. It's getting more value out of every hour we work. Um, and productivity, I think, in the current context is very much driven by innovation. 
innovation is not inventing stuff. It's not, it actually, innovation is not really the Blackberry. That's an invention which shows innovation. Innovation is what you guys do on the shop floor, in your business, in government offices every day, trying to be a little bit more creative in how you do things. Um, there are businesses in this country who have uh, a target of having a new idea or an innovation every 90 seconds. Um, one of them is an Ontario-based business, IBM. I know that some of their operations have a very high bar when it comes to innovation. But the challenge is how do you create a culture within your organization that's actually going to support innovation? So I stuck in this slide this morning because I didn't like the conclusion that I had. Um, I think this is more apt. We, we, we're clearly facing big challenges in a post-recovery world. Um, the U.S., you know, we're, we're lucky to live in this neighborhood. I think we live in the best neighborhood in the world, but our next door neighbor just kind of blew it, and they've got a long road back to stability. And that means that the benefit of free trade is lost for the moment. We have to find a way to rely less upon growth in the U.S. market, and maybe more on growth at home and growth in other parts of the world to ensure that eastern Ontario can have a really solid economic future. We're going to have to remove stimulus around the world, so that's going to deaden the economic growth potential for the world economy for the next three to five years. Um, and we have our own unique challenges in Canada, in Ontario, right here in Kingston and across eastern Ontario. We're now a strong currency economy. We've got an aging workforce. Um, but I think th those things are actually going to create the imperative for innovation. Uh, if I stand way back and look at all the discussion on innovation, a lot of it's been kind of pushing on a string because we were able to rely upon labor force growth and currency to stay competitive. We can't do that anymore. So the time's sort of come, uh, Eastern Ontario. Here's the chance to innovate. Um, I've put it up as a challenge. Are you up to the challenge? I can't answer that question. That's really up to you. Thanks very much for your attention. Ladies and gentlemen, I, I, my name is Dan Borowick. I'm the Director of Economic Development and Tourism for the County of Northumberland. And uh, we are running a bit tight on time, but there are microphones set up if you'd like to pose a few questions to Glenn. The information we've received certainly uh, puts everything in perspective. Um, so I would encourage you, if you have a question, ask it now. They're lining up. The <laughs> or they're going for dessert. <laughs> Two for dessert, one to the microphone. So I understand on the news, listen to the radio yesterday, that uh, China is going to let its currency float. I'd like, please, to, if you can define that, explain what it means by their policy decision, and perhaps explain what impact it might have on us. Okay, so let's separate the policy from the politics. What you saw yesterday was very clever politics on the part of the Chinese. Knowing that they were going to face pressure at the G20, they preempted it by announcing that they were going to let the currency float. The, the, the policy is more interesting, actually. China is a surplus country. They've been able to have huge trade surpluses and attract capital at the same time. They're now sitting on $2 trillion in foreign exchange reserves. And the Americans think, in particular, that they've been able to do that by have an having an artificially low currency. So the price of Chinese goods selling in North America and Europe is probably artificially low by, say, 20%. And that's why you've seen the U.S. government, Congress, the Europeans to some extent, leaning on the Chinese to try and change their policy. So China is now moving in the right direction. They're clearly in charge. They actually allowed their currency to float up. And then they did a little thing yesterday where they had a drop in value, almost a signal to the world that, hey, we might be moving the, in the right direction, but we're going to do it at our pace. Um, you know, when, you, when you've got 1.4 billion people, you can kind of do things like that. But that was, that was really a very sort of um, almost a crass political ploy but addressing a fundamental policy problem, which is the realignment of currencies around the world. Um, over the last two months, maybe I'll talk a bit about other currencies too, because I don't know if you noticed, but if you're planning on going to Britain this summer, you will get the best exchange rate you've probably seen in 25 years. The Canadian dollar is trading against the pound at about 155. It used to be 260. Same things happen against the euro. That's the fear factor playing out in global currency markets. So if you have other global traders whose currencies are dropping in value against ours, somebody has to take up the slack. We were actually taking up too much of the slack as a Canadian dollar. So China's now coming in as a surplus country, hopefully allowing their currency to rise over the next even five to ten years. And as part of that adjustment uh, in, in global currency markets. That's it? Well, I'll be around for a while if you want to come up and ask questions and 
plays something economist. But thank you very much again.